So on to our next speaker, Dean McElwee, who's the Integrated Commercial Lead for E-Commerce Europe at the Kellogg Company. So Dean's going to tell us a little bit about the future of emerging business models for, for us as FMCG suppliers. Uh, and Dean's got sort of an 18-year background as a commercial leader, working sales leadership, consulting and e-commerce. And he's got experience of working across Europe and in, into Africa, which gives him, I think, um, some very interesting insights and experiences. So uh, without further ado, over to you, Dean. Thanks, Francis. Thanks, Katie. And thanks, Sarah. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, so let me just kick off and I'll, I'll share my screen and then we can get going. So just really what I'm going to take you through here is, is a reflection of um, really what we're seeing in our businesses as, as some of the changes um, that we're going to see over the, over the coming year. And I think the important thing is just to just to highlight this is a, a quick whistle stop tour. It just gives you a flavor of some of the things we're seeing and what we'll need to do to take advantage of them. So in terms of what I'm going to take you through, I'm going to take you through an overview of Omnichannel and how we think that that's going to evolve, what we think is going to happen in the marketplace landscape, a bit about what's happening in B2B wholesale and some of the things that we're seeing there. And lastly, I think a big topic on everybody's mind at the moment is how to achieve success in, in, in e-com and what are some of the things we're seeing in terms of getting team dynamics right. So I think this was a, a visualization of what COVID has done and that's Newton's cradle on the left there. It's, it's really accelerated e-commerce adoption. And the quote, you know, I saw this earlier in the year from Tim Steiner saying, we'll see another doubling of the market in the next few years. And I think a couple of us may have thought, well, he was really trying to hedge his bets on, on where the market was going to be. But I think what we've all learned very quickly is that this is really accelerated e-commerce adoption, not only in grocery, but also in other industries as well. So what are we seeing in terms of omni-channel retail? And it's really going through a massive, massive evolution because of the shift to online. And a couple of the speakers have already talked this morning on a couple of these elements, but I'll just take you through a couple of the ones that we're seeing. The first is increased cost. Um, we've seen a number of retailers spending a lot of money on getting investments in fulfillment and technology right. And those may be differing fulfillment models, I'm looking at micro fulfillment, urban fulfillment. So there's quite a lot of capex going in um, in technology and fulfillment at the moment on on the retailer's behalf. There's also significant operating expense increases. So th there's lots of pickers, drivers, and vehicles being put on the road. I think uh, we talked earlier about the fact that the Tesco was hiring another fifteen thousand people for for this. Uh, season and trying to make sure that they can supply the demand that they're seeing. So really the question for us and for our retail partners is how do they maintain profitability? How do they maintain those levels of returns that the market wants from them? The second thing we're seeing a lot of is increased traffic. So the platforms that the retailers own um, are generating significant amount of traffic. You know, Tesco is sitting up around 38 million visits and quite a few of the UK retailers are doing similar amounts of visits and that's just desktop and mobile web based. Then what you've got is you've got significant app downloads going on. I think pretty early on in March, we saw app downloads growing very quickly. Um, and the, really the question for us and for the retailers is all this increased traffic that they're seeing through their platform, what are they going to do with it? What, what, what does it mean? Because Tesco, you're getting 38 million visits a week, but you've only got sort of one and a half, 38 million visits a month, but you've only got sort of one and a half million slots a week. So there's this big difference between the amount of traffic I'm generating and the amount of orders I'm fulfilling. Um, and how will retailers use that? The third one we're seeing is a lot of fulfillment complexity. I think one thing that we've learned very quickly, and, and there's been examples across the industry on this, is that multiple modes of fulfillment is really the only way to succeed at scale here. You look at Ocado's challenges in the beginning with their model and being able to scale that, and then all the other retailers, how do they manage this, this multi fulfillment model 
which is, can be picked from store, it can be urban fulfillment centers, it can be micro fulfillment, it can also be automated fulfillment. Um, there's also, as e-commerce scales very quickly, the cost of poor service online increases and that's really a cost for retailers so this is things like nil picks or subs when when they substitute an item who picks up the cost of that normally it's the retailer and when they have a nil pick or nothing gets delivered to you as a shopper that's a that's a poor experience so really the question for them and consequently for us is about how do we maintain availability online and the other big change for retailers is the increasing competition. What you've seen with Amazon this year is Amazon is putting a lot of emphasis on trying to grow specifically in the UK market, but also across broader Europe. They're entering new markets. They've entered the Netherlands. They're announcing Sweden later in the year. What you've also seen is a couple of new players entering the online space. And these are different fulfillment models, different aggregation models. So there, there are a lot of different models entering and a lot of different players entering. And then there's the need to compete against faster delivery methods. You know, just this week, you would have seen Iceland lodged a, a, a trademark for a swift delivery service. So something that really is trying to get that delivery in under an hour. And then the last one, and, and it's important for all the omnichannel retailers is discounters and discounters moving online. And the question that, that I think we're asking ourselves is how do retailers differentiate themselves when you have just the same front-end web platform? Increasingly, people are managing their, their store visits between online and offline, and we've got to make sure that the retailers can differentiate themselves online. So really, the, the, the question for us as uh, suppliers to retailers and, and the industry at large is how do we how do we manage this environment with this increased costs increased traffic fulfillment complexity and competition so in terms of what we we look at from the increased co cost perspective is it's important in an omni-channel world to understand your own profitability how can we understand the profitability of our omni-channel customers for both their online business and their offline business, and equally our online and offline businesses. The second thing is, how can we look at e-commerce specific packs that give both of us the opportunity to make a bit of extra margin, supplement some of the costs, and also differentiate the online experience? The third thing for us is to make sure that the pay for performance that we put in place for e-com actually helps us to deliver the, the solution we want. It was great hearing from Bayer earlier in the day talk about that and how did they lock that in, in in terms of making sure that they could get value for what they were paying for. I think for us as well is to understand retailers' cost drivers. What are these things that are, are, are pushing their costs up? Things like substitutes, things like nil picks. Um, what are the other costs that they are seeing? And, and very important, element for all of us is with increased costs is joint business planning. How do we do that to make sure we deliver that mutually beneficial growth for both of us? From an increased traffic point of view, I think we're seeing a couple of different things and a couple of different solutions. Retail media is going to become even more important over the next two years. These retailers got huge platforms that are generating even more traffic than they did in previous years. Um, it was great to hear the analytics presentation because I think understanding how much money you're making from your retail media, the return on investment is absolutely going to be key. And certainly, I think for us, we'll see a lot of closed loop attribution where retail is one of the few channels where they have the sales data and they're communicating to the shopper and really being able to understand that will help us drive and validate the ROIs in the industry. Um, one thing that we all know is that very few people are exclusively online shoppers, particularly in grocery. So for us, it's about making sure that we understand what the value of our omnichannel shoppers are so that we can ensure the investment behind the media and other things that we need to do online. And for all of us, as all these shoppers move online, recruit, recruitment and retention should be our main objective. The other element of this is the fulfillment complexity. What you've got is you've now got availability in multiple locations, which 
drives complexity not only for the retailer but for us as suppliers too and this is availability through pick from, pick from store models, it's from urban fulfillment centers, it's from dark stores. And as I mentioned, there, there's multiple areas there um, where stock is going to be picked from and that's going to be increasingly complex. And, and I think suppliers will need to get their head around how to do that. And then there's also the opportunity of these stores or back of stores. I think we talked earlier in the morning about retailers carving out space in their store. And, and that's going to be a way to add additional fast moving store, stock into the store. The element of that is understand what those retail cost drivers are, null picks and subs. So substitutes are challenging for us from an e-commerce point of view because the product may drop out of favorites, but it's also non cost to the retailer and um, that we need to help them with to understand why those are happening and help prevent them from happening going forward. And I think all these new fulfillment models, especially dark stores, dark warehouses and automated warehouses look, offer us the opportunity of how can we extend our range and offer different assortments online to what's in store. Um, from a competition perspective, what we're looking at is saying, how can we help retailers achieve differentiation through packs and activation? And then how can we embrace those new models as the point of purchase shift? And I think that's a very important point for all of us is online is a point of purchase. It's, it's another location. So how do we win at that point of purchase by having a clear commercial plan for each model? In terms of marketplaces, some of the things we're seeing very quickly uh, happen are, we're seeing new marketplaces. You're seeing emerging players in the UK such as OnBuy, We've heard a lot of um, mention of European players such as Picnic looking at markets like the UK. Retail partnerships, um, Amazon is certainly partnering with, with, with a couple and partnerships allow Amazon to sell more, make more from an advertising and sales perspective and important for them to learn more. And, and it's, it's, it's very key that we look and understand what they're doing there. From a faster fulfillment perspective, marketplaces are driving a lot of this, this disruption. So faster fulfillment drives more engagement um, on the platforms and more market shares. Slots limit the capacity really for omni-channel and pure players. And the last one, which is quite an interesting one, is retailers are looking to leverage and monetize these platforms with all this traffic, but still offer shoppers assortment breadth. And that's where we're seeing omni-channel retail marketplaces. Um, Carrefour launched one in, in June, uh, Kroger's announced one, Walmart has one running. So it wouldn't surprise me if, given the size of the UK e-commerce market, that one of the major retailers or two of them, three of them perhaps, look to set up a, a marketplace on their platforms and take advantage of their traffic. So what does that mean for us? It means that as uh, manufacturers and as suppliers to this industry, we've got to look at to onboard these new marketplaces. Um, as I said, they're a point of purchase. We've got to learn how to win there and make sure that we execute that because they're not going to go away. Those platforms are going to become more important. And to do that, we're going to have to look at how we supply those marketplaces and leverage the scale of the multiple marketplaces that exist. The second one is retail partnerships. How can we partner to gain market share um, and use those platforms as media inventory? It was great to hear the, the analytics side because really understanding those platforms and marketplaces have is, is really key for us to, to make sure that we take advantage of them. The third is faster fulfillment and faster fulfillment is uh, really a key one for the retailers. But I think it's also a huge opportunity for us as suppliers, particularly in things like impulse. Um, a colleague, an ex-colleague of mine who's talking later today, Simon Miles, once said to me, he said, not everybody's looking for a faster car um, and you've got to build a different offer. And that is that stuck with me, particularly when I look at this faster fulfillment, because can we do different pricing and promotions that take advantage of that faster fulfillment model? Omnichannel retail marketplaces are going to come. I'm quite convinced that this will be an area that retailers will, will, will track on. 
And certainly when we look at that, the importance of digital shelf basics will become even more important. Um, you're going to go from 200 SKUs in a category to 500 when the retailers open their doors to other suppliers. And being really great at the basics is going to be absolutely key. Um, that once again presents an opportunity for us as suppliers that there may be a hybrid model exists where you supply, let's say, car for directly, but then you also supply on a 3P type model. So I think that's quite an interesting development. Um, I'll run through B2B quickly. So B2B is, is um, going to take off and has already started to take off. So this is the likes of uh, Best Way and Booker. Um, and really what they're going to be challenging all of us on is digital shelf content that's tailored to the needs of that business shopper and sector specific data points. So you'll, you'll see food service really relies on additional data points. How can, how can we provide that to them? Um, you're going to see a lot more segmented execution in our view. So these specific solutions targeting specific subchannels will definitely be a, a thing that we see going forward. And it'll be through these whole, wholesale platforms, but utilizing the same infrastructure that, that is typically used. Um, they're also asking for and wanting to provide to their owner operators additional business enablers. So Metro, we've seen providing websites to individual restaurants, to individual stores. They're even doing product photography for some of the restaurants, which is quite interesting, offering staffing solutions, offering social media software as a service, which is, is really quite an interesting trend. Um, and the last one that we've seen is segment-specific marketplaces. So these are channel-specific marketplaces. Um, two of the ones in Europe that we've seen is Megaloop, which is targeted convenience stores, but connects suppliers with these independent operators. And Coparam is the other one, which is catering mainly to the hotels, restaurants, catering industry, but offers a specific sub-segment of these marketplaces. So I think what you'll see is marketplaces across retail, across sort of wholesale route to market, um, and then the, the sort of pure player marketplaces will continue to develop. So what does this mean for us as, as uh, suppliers and manufacturers in the space? One is we're going to have to develop content focused on business buyers and their in-store needs, which is slightly different to what we're doing on the likes of a Tesco. So what is the content that they are looking for? What are the messages that a, a business buyer wants you to do? Search strategies in B2B wholesale will, will need to change because the reality is wholesale buyers from the research that we've seen focus their search really on branded search as opposed to unbranded search. And, and that brings with it a whole set of challenges around misspellings and focuses on different ways that people understand your products. The second one is segmented execution. How can we develop plans based on those specific subchannels online? And how can we activate them? And can we deliver pricing promotions and activation options through these retailers by those subchannels and go and target them? The business enable one, enablers one is, a, is, a, is an interesting one, but it's really how can we partner to drive execution and enable success within those verticals that those retailers operate in. Um, so how can we enable a restaurant to succeed with the products and services that we offer them? I think segment specific marketplaces, we're gonna all need business plans for what those look like and adopt them and, and take advantage of them as they grow. And certainly for us is, how can you leverage a marketplace strategy in sort of emerging verticals really where such as hotel restaurants and catering where perhaps marketplaces are still new but will develop and develop pretty quickly. Um, it was great to hear Lucy talk earlier about a couple of data and a couple of the other things on this page. So I think you know, just in summary, some of what we're seeing and making sure we focus on to achieve success at scale in e-commerce is about making sure that we understand data. Data and metrics matter, and they matter because data supports performance and the investment that you make behind your e-commerce ambitions. The second one is, is metrics, make sure, because what matters offline doesn't always translate online, and we've heard a lot of that, lot of that today. 
Um, teamwork, you need to build a multifunctional team of logistics, finance, digital marketing, shopper marketing, and the attributes certainly that, are, that we look for are curiosity and an iterative learning culture. The great thing about e-commerce is the ability to test, learn, and redo. And that's really a culture that we should be trying to build. The third one is process, not project. E-commerce needs to be embedded into business processes, not treated as a once-off project. Let's get sufficiency up on our digital shelf. It's not that. It needs to be integrated into your business processes and made sure that it's embedded throughout all your teams. The fourth one is to democratize capability because an understanding of e-commerce, um, even with teams that aren't as involved as we are in e-commerce, will help your business drive more long-term support. The fifth one is strategy. Be clear what you're going to focus on. I think what all of us, I'm sure, are finding is there's lots to focus on. There's more than enough to do. It's just being clear on what you want to focus on. And the other important one is even online, everything is a point of purchase. Where, where do you want to be and why do you want to be there? And what do you want to deliver there? Those, those are absolutely key important points. The last one is that basics matter. Um, basics in e-commerce are absolutely the foundation of everything you do. And e-commerce e amplifies everything in the business. If your master data isn't clean, it will amplify when it goes to the digital shelf and the, and, and the data isn't there. Um, if your processes don't absolutely align and, and support e-commerce, e-commerce will amplify that and it will, it will make sure that everybody focuses the, the business around solving that problem. So the, the second one there is master data. How do we get master data right and support the, our e-commerce ambitions? I think we're going to hear a bit more on roundtables later this afternoon on master data, but we found that's an absolute key to, to making sure we, we sort that out. Um, replication, multiplication, versioning is a, is a factor of e-commerce, and it's really how do we mitigate that and make sure we um, minimize that as much, much as possible. The last word of advice is automate wherever you can. Um, E-commerce is complex, it's challenging, and where you can, automate it. So if it's reporting, automate it. You're gonna have lots of Excel spreadsheets. You're gonna have lots of different areas where you store data. So managing to automate wherever you can is absolutely key. Thank you very much, uh, Dean. Very, very insightful. Some great material there. Unfortunately, uh, I have to play the clock watcher role today and unfortunately we've run out of time for any questions. So um, thank you again for what you did. I'm sure uh, people can reach out to you directly in case uh, they've got a burning question for you. So with that, I'll hand over to uh, Katie to uh, uh, run the next section. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, Francis.